Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good? You guys enjoying yourself so far? All right. Good to hear. Good to hear. My name is Jeff. I am the president of the San Diego Marine Aquarium Society. We are the host this year. That's the right bow down. Um, so thank you guys. We really appreciate you for coming. Uh, I hope you guys are, like I said, having a good time. With that said, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mark Callahan. Good. First, I want to say thanks to ST Mass for uh, putting on Magna and having me out. If it, everything looks like it's running smoothly, it's because they're probably dealing with 100 headaches behind the scenes and making it go well for everyone. So let's give a shout out to ST Mass and Jeff and the rest of the crew. I apologize in advance if I sound a little hoarse or if my voice cracks. I seem to be coming down with something, but don't worry, I did pass through middle school. <laughs> All right, so my name is Mark Callahan, also known as Mr. Saltwater Tank. I run a website called MrSaltwaterTank.com and have a show on YouTube called Mr. Saltwater Tank TV. How many of you have heard about me before this moment? Ah, there you go. Perfect, thank you for letting me know. I do a couple of things besides the show. I've written a series of books on anywhere from setting up a saltwater tank, algae control, to keeping things um, safe when you're out of town, and everyone's favorite subject, moving and upgrading a saltwater tank. Because if this is your first tank, here's a hint of coming attractions, you will upgrade. It happens. So I also do other things such as build tanks for clients. This is a 436 gallon tank I put out in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, in an office building. I'll be talking to you about that tank later today. Uh, this is a 200 gallon tank on the second story of a house in uh, Washington, DC. Fun backstory on this tank was that it was almost dropped on the way up the staircase. This is why I use movers to move tanks, because if they drop it, I go, <laughs> buy me another one. My goal with clients is to take them from this to this, and just to give you all a timeline, that's six months, that's two years, and that's all done under LEDs. So if you think LEDs don't grow coral, there's six months, there's two years. We'll leave it at that. I also consult on tanks as well. Here's a temperate tank in California, just up the beach here. Um, two times Architectural Digest House of the Year. This is actually a temperate system. I did not install it, but I do consult on uh, tanks as well once they are installed. That being said, enough about me. Let's talk about tank automation. That's what I'm going to talk to you all about for about the next 30, 40 minutes. Let's define it to keep, get us started. The nice definition from Webster says it's automation is a technique, method, or system of operating and controlling a process by highly automatic means as by electronic devices reducing human intervention to a minimum. That's a lot of words for a Saturday afternoon in Magna. So let's condense that. In other words, set it and largely, in parentheses, forget it. Now, in talking to clients about their project when I'm building their tank, inevitably tank automation comes up. And when talking to a client about tank automation, I said, well, let's talk about the tank automation on your system. And they gave me a look like this. And I said, oh boy, what did I say? And they said, well, I'm not interested at all, period. Don't talk to me about tank automation. End of discussion. It's like, OK. I clearly have struck a chord with you. Why not? And he says, I have to maintain the illusion that I'm busy. Otherwise, my wife puts me to work. <laughs> like, you know, I don't do marriage counseling, but uh, you might want to talk to someone else about that. So I am a big fan of tank automation. Let's talk about why. Number one, it's going to give you more quality time with your tank. The goal of tank automation is not necessarily to take you away from your tank. I was talking to someone yesterday, so they said, what are you talking about, Mark? I said, tank automation. They go, oh, I don't like it, because then it takes me away from my tank. I want to work with the tank. I said, well, that's not the right idea. Tank automation doesn't have to take you away from the tank. I just want to change the time that you have with your tank. I want it to be, for lack of better words, a happy time with your tank. You don't want to be dealing with this. This hobby is a lot of fun until you, it's not a lot of fun when you deal with things like basic algae outbreaks, or dead fish. Here's a tuxedo urchin that decided that eating a fox face that was dead would be a good idea. Or dealing with the things that we all hate to see, dead coral. No one likes to deal with dead coral, let alone dead fish. So we want to improve your time with your tank. And I also want to give you guys back, some guys and gals, do I have any lady reefers in the room? Just, you're all sitting together. Except for, you, you want to move over there? It's like. You can like spread out, you know. I know it's mainly guys, but we're friendly. <laughs> so guys and gals, either way, we want to improve your time with your tank. We want to give you the control to work with the tank when you want to. 
Now, tank headaches, when they come up, it's something you got to deal with immediately. It's like a fire. You got to go put that fire out. Well, I want to reduce those fires in your tank so that you don't have to deal with them. And if they do come up, well, you have the control to deal with them when you want. I was talking with a client, and she said, the happiest thing that I've ever done, number one, was hire you, and number two was have you automate my tank, because then it gives me the control to deal with things when I want to. She has four children and runs a very successful uh, entrepreneur practice as well. She's a financial advisor, and there are times when she gets busy. Everyone gets busy. And she said, with the tank being automated, if I look at something and I know I don't have time, I can put it off, and I know the tank's still going to function. In other words, she says, I just don't feel guilty about ignoring the tank for the moment. Also, I realize that some of you in the room are anti-tank automation. Here's a nice little fun fact for you. You're already doing it. It's already going on very likely in your tank. These things, heaters, auto top-off system. Chances are all of us in the room, or a very large percentage of us, are already using these things on our tanks. Now, here in sunny San Diego, it's 78 and sunny every single day, as you can tell for those of you that have been here. Chances are you still got to use a heater. You're still going to have water evaporation. So this type of automation is already going on in your tank. So if you've already started down the road of tank automation, why not just keep going? It also enhances stability in your tank. As reef keepers, this has been beaten to our heads. It's all about stability, right? How many times have we heard that? Here's a hint. Your tank does not think that's cool. You might. It doesn't like all these peaks and valleys. It sees that and it runs away. It wants to run away. It gets scared. It likes this. This is the most boring ride at Disneyland that there is. Like little teapots things that your kids or grandkids think is really cool and that's a thrill and you're like, oh boy. Woo, okay. That's what your tank wants. It doesn't want to change a lot. Little rise, little fall, but mostly everything stays the same. Another way to think about your tank is a grumpy old man that doesn't want to change. <laughs> Sanjay's a friend of mine, I, I can give him a hard time. So, the more stable your tank is, the more we're going to get close to this, and the more you're going to have this kind of success. I would think that we all would like this, except you fish only with live rock people in the room. Are there any fish only with live rock people here? One? There's always, yeah, that one guy that's like... It's all right, there's nothing wrong with being a fish only with live rock type. So, continuing on this theme, why am I also a fan of tank automation, and why should you be as well? Well, it's easier for you to be gone. So you know, that's Fiji. If you haven't entered the Fiji drawing yet, I recommend that you go. I was there two weeks ago, life-changing event. So when you're away from your tank, it's easier for you to walk away and know that everything is mostly all white. Some people say, you know what, I don't want to know what's going on with my tank when I'm on vacation. I want to go on vacation and just be completely oblivious to anything going wrong. And I say, really? Because if you come back and you walk through the door and the first thing you see is your tank that has melted down, it's milky white and everything's dead, you're never going to remember what happened on that vacation other than you walked through the door and then you came back and you found your tank dead. So when you walk away, you can know that everything is going as well as possible. Or when emergency happens. Now those of you who are from San Diego, you don't know what this is. This is called snow. Those of you from the Midwest or Minnesota, you're like, oh yeah, that looks like fun. That's no big deal. That's only four feet. We can make that a no problem. Here's the thing about tank emergencies. They always happen when you're gone, every single time. And the really funny thing about me saying this right now is that my tank buddy who usually watches my tank when I'm out of town is sitting in this room. I'm not watching his tank, he's not watching mine, and my phone's on airplane mode, so if anything goes wrong for the next 30 minutes, we're safe. Oh, he's checking on my tank right now, there you go. <laughs> That's the sign of a good tank buddy. All right, it also creates safety nets for you. If you've had a saltwater tank and nothing has gone wrong, you just haven't been in the hobby long enough. Something will go wrong. It happens every single time. Unfortunately, it's just part of the hobby. Here's a big one that happens. Floods. Major or minor floods. How many of you have had a flood around your saltwater tank? Okay, those of you that are not raising your hands, it's probably because your spouse is sitting next to you and you're able to hide it. <laughs> it happens. Here's another big point of failure, another emergency is with your tanks. Heaters. These things always fail at some point. I don't have the exact stats, I've never seen a study on it, but I would say with a good amount of confidence that heaters are the number one place where saltwater tanks fail. It happens, and of course it's going to happen when you're not there. I speak from experience. Here's my heater that failed. This is a titanium heating tube. Somehow the titanium cracked, water got in, and salt water got all around that nice copper heating coil and dumped a whole bunch of copper into my tank. 
Exactly, right? Now, I was out of the house. Luckily, I was still local. I came in and said, huh, water level on the tank's a little bit low. I was able to find out that the heater was melting down because when I threw the power breaker, smoke started billowing out of my sump. That's not good. I got lucky I was in town. I did a huge water change on the tank and I didn't have any ill effects. I was very lucky. I'm not going through this again. So this is why I put safety nets into my tank, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later. Now, tank automation can be high or low tech. I know for some of you, the thought of technology scares you. How many of you are anti-technology in the room? You still have a pager? That's sweet. OK. <laughs> it can be high or low tech. Here's the high tech solution. There's a lot of tank controllers out there on the market. And then here's some low tech solutions. <laughs> yeah, those are awesome, right? Does anyone still use these? OK, that's cool. Does anyone miss them that doesn't use them anymore? Exactly. Once it's gone, you're like, thank goodness. I mean, the lights turned on at 8 or 8.20, and then maybe 10 o'clock they turn off. You don't know. And the power goes out, and you've got to reset it. Here's a nice low tech. This is it, auto top off or RODI unit shut off valve. There's not much to this, but it is tank automation because when the water level rises in your tank, the top off unit or the RODI unit shuts off. Here's some real world tank automation, low tech. Here's how a guy doses his tank. This is an IV bag and the drip rate is controlled with air tube, air valves. Where he got the IV bags, I don't ask that question. He's got one for his alkalinity solution, one for calcium, one for magnesium. And it works for him. I don't recommend it, but it can work for you. So if you're an anti-tech person, that's OK. There's lots of low-tech solutions, such as auto top off, simple float valves. Works great. Here's a high and low indicator in the sump. Again, just with float valves. Float valves is very low-tech, old technology that we still use. So if you fear tech, you can still automate your tank. Don't worry, you're not in the wrong room. I'm not going to dive into all this high-tech stuff. I'll still take care of you as well. There's passive automation too. It doesn't have to happen automatically. These things can happen in the background without really any technology at all. For example, how about some overflow drains? Here's a sump that I put in a tank up top in the upper right. Those are two bulkheads. One is for doing water changes and the other one is slightly higher. That's in case of overflow. Now this works if you have a drain close by because the sump fills up. It overflows and it runs down the drain. There's really not much automation to this. There's certainly not any technology other than a bulkhead and a bunch of PVC pipe and glue, but it works. Here's how it looks installed. Again, the bulkhead or the ball valve in front, that's for the water changes, and the one in the back is the emergency drain. All right, so going back to my friend Sanjay, he says, automate everything that you can. And I'm younger than Sanjay, so of course I have something to say about that. I say, automate everything you can when it makes your life easier. You have to ask yourself when you're looking at automating something in your tank, is it really making your life easier? Now, I'm a high tech kind of gadget guy. I get shiny object syndrome. You know, I get those emails and I'm like, ooh, new product. Check everything out, watch the video, and I'm like, ah, should I buy it or not? I get really excited about new stuff. However, I have to take a step back and say, is this really worth it? What am I actually gaining from automating this? Because sometimes it's not worth it. Here's a great example. This is that roller mat thing that came out a while ago. The idea is you can stop pulling your filter socks out of your tank, which takes about 30 seconds, and put this thing in. And it turns the roller continuously, bringing new filter media in contact with the falling water, and you don't have to change filter socks anymore. However, let's look at what we're gaining in exchange for putting something on like this. We have a bunch of ball valves, excuse me, a bunch of bulkheads that can leak. We have float valves that can fail. And at some point, you've got to change the roller mat material, assuming that you can stand the stench after it's been in there for a month. So in exchange for not pulling down a filter sock and putting a new one in, that might take you 30 seconds to maybe a minute, maybe two minutes if you get distracted by looking at your tank, we're going to put all this complication into the system. To me, it doesn't make any sense. If you don't have time to change a filter sock, you're in the wrong hobby. Sometimes tank automation, well, it just doesn't work in your case. Let's look at this, automatic fish feeders. I have a Bengay cardinal fish that could care less about any kind of food other than the biggest, fleshiest mysis shrimp that I throw at it. It says, I want the filet mignon, give it to me now. So auto feeders are not good at feeding frozen food. There's not any out yet that do that. These guys, the auto feeders here feed flakes and they feed pellets. 
My Bengay kernel doesn't want anything to do with it. So if the food isn't getting eaten, then it's going to foul up the tank in time and cause more headaches for me than it's worth. So in this case, it's tank automation. For me, it doesn't work. If your fish all eat pellets, more power to you. Rock on and put it in your tank. So ask yourself, is it really making your life any easier? Here's a big one. Is it fail safe? Now, as I said, at some point you're going to have an emergency. Something's going to go wrong with your tank. This is definitely true with tank automation as well. Do we have any engineers in the room? Yeah, a couple of you guys. So you guys know about fail safe. So let me explain fail safe for those of you that don't know what it is. Fail safe says if this item, if this piece of electronics, whatever fails, is it going to fail in a safe way? Easiest example of this is cruise control on your car. Now, people in San Diego don't use that because they drive like a bat down a hell all the time, but that's all right. I think it's a Southern California thing. It's like the one time there's no traffic jams, everyone's like, go! <laughs> Have a lot of fun. So cruise control, you set it and it maintains the speed of your car without you having to put your foot on the gas. And it's designed to be fail safe such that if it fails, it takes the gas off and it decelerates the car. It gives you back control of the gas. If it was not fail safe, it would maintain the speed or speed up, which is not good. So in this case, we have to say, is what you're putting on your tank fail safe? Now, the sad reality is a lot of stuff in the saltwater tank industry isn't not engineered to the same level as cars. Cars are regulated by the government. The saltwater tank industry isn't yet, thank goodness. So things are not fail safe. You have to put them, kind of give them their own layer of redundancy to make them as fail safe as they can be. Big one where is not fail safe is plumbing your RODI unit straight into your sump. These float valves are not fail safe. If they fail, they're likely going to fail on and let water continuously into your system. Not fail safe. Heaters, not fail safe. When they fail, they either don't turn on and your tank gets cold, or they stay on and your tank cooks. Either one of those, not good. And as I said before, heaters fail a lot. And for those of you that are anti-tech guys who are sitting there going, oh yeah, high technology, it always fails. High or low tech stuff can fail. Let's go back to this. RODI unit plumbs straight into your tank with a float valve acting as your auto top off system. Horrendous idea. True story, a couple years ago, a guy came up to me and we were talking about his tank. He said, you know, the worst thing that's ever happened to me with my tank is that I went away for a week and I came back to 25,000 gallons of RODI water in my basement. And I said, oh, you had your RODI unit plumbed into your sump, didn't you? And he's like, yes, I did. It failed. It failed hours after he walked out of his house, because it always happens that way. And it ran continuously for a week. And his saltwater tank eventually became fresh water. And of course, everything died. And then his basement filled up with water. And he got the water bill, 25,000 gallons of water in his basement. So they ripped the tank out. They ripped down all the drywall, and they started over. So these things are not fail safe. If you have this going on in your tank, I highly recommend you go home, finish the lecture first, go home and fix it. See, those guys are already going home to fix it. <laughs> They're like, oh, I got to go. <laughs> That's bad. <clears throat> That's good. People are learning. <laughs> All right, how can you add in redundancy? Because something's going to go wrong. Well, how can we add in some safety nets for ourselves? Chillers. Some of you have to use these things. That would be the metal halide and T5 guys, most likely. How many of you are still running metal halides? A couple of you. How many of you are still running T5s? OK. That's usually how it is. You're kind of in pockets. And usually the T5 guys and gals are all on one side of the room, and the halide guys are on the other, and all the LED people in the center. It's like you can't hang out with one another. You live in Phoenix, right? It's 110, 10 months out of the year. So yeah, exactly. I live there. I remember what it's like. It's hot in the shade. Yeah. You are going to have a chiller. If you live in Phoenix, if you're running high heat lighting, you're going to have these. These have a built-in thermostat that tell them to turn on if the tank gets too warm. However, you can add very easy redundancy in. This is the Ranko temp thermometer, arguably the most robust temperature regulator out there. It has a simple probe, sits in your sump, and then it has a power plug where you plug your chiller into. So you have your chiller that has this built-in thermostat, then you add on the temperature controller on top of it. If for some reason your chiller goes haywire, then the other temperature control can take over and shut it off. Now, we can take this a step further and add another layer of redundancy and make your tank controller control both of these things. So the chiller is controlled by its own internal thermometer, 
and then the temperature control, the Renko controls it, and then you can have your tank controller keep an eye on all that. So it's another layer of redundancy. We're just making things safer. We're trying to set them as fail-safe as they can be because they're not out of the box. Heaters, again, these fail. Here's a very simple, low-tech solution that you can put on your heaters. They have a built-in thermostat. You can add another thermostat on top of it. This is made by Cobalt. These guys are in the trade show floor. You can go talk to them about this. This is what they call their Neostat. This is another uh, temperature probe, sits in your sump. You set on what temperature you want it to turn on and off. It's going to control your heater. Catch here is, let's say you set your heater at 78, set the Neotherm at 80. That way the heater is mostly doing its job. If it fails and fails on, then the Neostat will take over. You don't want the two fighting one another. So set the Neostat higher than the heater. Now, for those of you that have a tank controller, you can do the exact same thing on the tank controller. Just make sure the tank controller on and off temp is set higher than the thermostat on your heater. Now, here's a question that only each of you have to answer on your own because everyone is going to be different. How centralized of a system can you tolerate? In other words, how much do you want to depend on one or two pieces of equipment? Let's look at an example. So you have a tank controller. How many of you run tank controllers in the room? Okay, about half, that's about right. How many of you are thinking about running a tank controller? How many of you are convinced you're going to win the tank controller in the raffle? <laughs> I like your positivity. All right, people in California, they just are happy all the time. They don't have to do a snow. All right, so if you have your tank controller controlling your dosing pumps, your heaters, your lights, your return pump, and your calcium reactor or your skimmer, if it goes down, all of these systems are going to go down. It's all dependent on your tank controller. Now let's look at how we can decentralize our control, so to speak. A tank controller and then a standalone doser. This is a GHL doser that I used for years. This runs a program that you set on its own internal controller. So it doesn't need a tank controller to function. They function independently of one another. How much you want to run of each? Well, we'll take you through an example and you can decide what you're comfortable with. Let's say your tank controller controls a dosing pump. These are the 1.1 milliliter dosing pumps from Bulk Resupply, very popular solution. I've used these for years with great success. This pump only knows how to be on. You plug it into an outlet, it just runs. So the tank controller is going to control it. You can set up some very simple programming or logic with it and say, you know what? If my pH gets above 8.6, it's probably because my alkalinity is too high, so let's turn off that alkalinity doser. Very simple. If you have other dosing pumps for calcium and magnesium, all the tank controller is going to do is turn off that alkalinity doser and let everything else run. Now, if we went with a more decentralized type of system, you have the tank controller, you have the dosing pump that's going to run your calcium, magnesium, and your alkalinity, the standalone doser, if we go through the same logic, you know what, pH is too high, it's probably because my alkalinity dosing is potentially stuck on, well, let's turn off the alkalinity doser. In this case, it's going to turn off all the dosing pumps. So there's a trade-off there. You might want to just turn off the alkalinity doser, but then you have to rely on the tank controller to do all the job for you. In this case, if your tank controller fails, that's not a problem. Just plug this standalone doser into an outlet, and it will continue to do its thing. All right. Here's another hard part when it comes to tank controller that you have to manage when it comes to tank automation. I asked an MIT engineer once about getting things automated, and he said it's always easier to do things the complicated way. The hard part is doing it the simple way. In other words, it's always easy to add something else onto your tank. And chances are you're a gadget guy like me and you like shiny new objects. It's a lot of fun to go walk around the trade show floor and see new stuff and add stuff to your tank. However, you have to ask yourself, is it really making your life easier? What am I getting out of it? <laughs> yeah. Makes sense, right? This is a tank in Texas I was brought in to actually tear down and completely rebuild. And I opened up underneath this, this tank and the stand and I said, what in the heck is all that? We've got RODI unit here with some kind of top-off system. Over on the left, we have a return pump and then another heater system and exposed electrical outlets. And I asked the owner, I said, what is all this for? He says, I don't know. You put it in there. It's like, yeah, but I've done it over so many years, I've just forgotten what it's all for. <laughs> it's always easy to add something on. How can you get some more automation done in your tank without adding on any more complexity? Plan B. As I said, something will always go wrong. Bob, everything's good on our tanks, right? Okay, good. 
All right, so let's plan B. Let's look at an example. You have run in a tank controller that runs your return pump and it manages your skimmer as well. This is a very nice thing to do because you can say, turn off the return pump, turn off the skimmer as well. When I turn back on the return pump, I want you to wait a couple minutes to turn back on the skimmer. That way the water level on your sump drops and your skimmer doesn't overflow and dump all that nice smelling skimmate right back into your tank. However, what happens if your tank controller goes kaput? All that's going to happen now is that the return pump knows to be on, the skimmer knows to be on, and any logic between the two is lost. Well, a very simple solution, and low-tech as well, for those of you that like low-tech solutions, go grab two surge protectors like this, put your skimmer on one, put your return pump on the other, turn on your return pump, come back in a couple minutes, and you can turn on your skimmer very easy. It gives you a plan B in case something goes wrong. Now, that's a very minor thing, not the end of the world. If that happens, let's talk about something more important. What if your lights go out and they're controlled by any kind of tank controller? What happens? Can they stand on their own? Can they continue to run that program without being told what to do? If your lights come on your tank, you've got three, three days is safe. When it starts getting around five days, then I start getting worried. At that point, corals are going to start to die because they're photosynthetic. You're going to have problems in your tank. And of course, it's going to happen when it's not a convenient time for you. Either you're out of town, or in my case, I had some lights go off once that I was using that didn't know what to do without a tank controller telling them what to do. It died Friday at 4 o'clock, and I called the manufacturer there in California. I was like, well, this is good. They can get me one out today. I said, all right, I need a new light. And they said, we'll get it in the mail to you. I said, well, when is it going to get here? They're like, oh, maybe next week, probably the week after. I'm like, well, that doesn't work. This is lights for the tank. I need them now. So he said, okay, well, we can overnight them to you. Well, of course, it was Friday. It was too late. So they're going to ship it on Monday. It's going to get here Tuesday. But of course, I was going out of town. So that didn't work. So in this case, we ha if you're looking at a lighting solution, you have to ask, can this light run on its own without any kind of controller? Because if the controller dies, whatever that, either your tank controller or any other type of controller that feeds it information, that's going to be a problem because your light's either going to turn off completely which in the case you've got four days, maybe five days max, or even worse, your lights are going to stay on at the setting where they were last on, which might be 100%. And then if, here's a hint, leaving your lights on for five days in a row at 100%, your corals will not like you. Not a good thing. All right. Let's look at another type of scenario here. You have a standalone doser that goes kaput. Even if you have a tank-controlled doser that goes kaput, again, this happens. Here's a nice low-tech solution where you can get it done. We used to dose things by hand. It can work. It's not tank automation, but you can always go back to this. In my case, I run a calcium reactor. I have jugs in my house with two-part solution mixed up, ready to go. If I have to, I can go back to this very quickly. I can implement it like that. So this is a plan B that's very low tech. Here's a piece of tank automation that, again, fails a lot, a heater. This is something that's very easy to implement and is a term, term type of passive uh, automation as well. Putting a heater on your tank. Let's say you need 1,000 watts of heating power to keep your tank warm. That would be those of you in Minnesota. Instead of putting 1,000 watt heater, put two smaller heaters on your tank. Two 500 will get the job done. In this case, you have two undersized heaters. If one fails, in case it stays on, it's going to take longer to overheat your tank because it's slightly undersized by itself. And it's very unlikely that they're both going to fail at the same time. You're giving yourself the safety net simply by adding two heaters into your tank. Now, I wish Mark Levinson was in the room. He's a Star Trek guy. Anyone know Scotty's famous line? Beam me up. Besides beam me up? <laughs> like, I, I don't have the power, right? Can't do it, Captain. Don't have the power. Well, there's some things that tank automation just can't do, at least yet. Go back to my Bangai Cardinal fish. There's no automatic frozen fish food feeder. There's one that's been, quote, in the works for four years. And every time I call the company, they're like, oh, yeah, it's getting closer. It's been four years. <laughs> so sometimes fish cannot be fed because there is not a frozen fish feeder. That's the shortcoming of tank automation there. There's no viable solution, in my opinion, yet for changing things like a filter sock. You still got to get someone in there to pull the socks out. It doesn't take long, but someone's got to show up and get it done. What about cleaning your skimmer? If you're gone for any amount of time, it's going to get gunked up. You need to clean that thing so it runs efficiently. 
Yes, there are solutions like this. However, my clients that run this uh, neck wiper, even though I told them I don't recommend it, they still run it. They say, you gotta take this thing out once a week and clean it down, otherwise the skimmer performance really suffers. So there's some things that are just don't lend themselves to tank automation just yet. So maybe in time it will, but not now. All right, so I've talked to you a lot about concepts. Let's make the rubber meet the road here. Let's look at an example. Tank automation. First thing we said, is it fail safe? And then how can we add in some redundancy? How centralized of a system can you tolerate? That's the next question to ask yourself. And what's plan B? Something is going to go wrong. And again, what are you gaining out of the automation, the complexity that you're adding to your system? Whenever we add something to the system, we're inevitably adding some complexity to it. So let's look at an example. Here is the 436 gallon tank in Nowhere, South Dakota. This tank is in an office building. My client does not own this office building. If something's gonna go wrong, she's gonna get in big trouble. So I put in many systems on this tank that I'm gonna walk you through to help prevent it all having to do with tank automation. So in this case, we took over her break room, her employee's break room, and put in a fish room. You can do that when you're the boss. So we have a sump on the left, a mixing station on the right. I'm gonna walk you through all these components. The one thing that you cannot see in this picture is the drains in all of those trays. The sump and the mixing station both sit in a PVC tray that's watertight, and there's a drain that I put into those trays that drain into the floor drain in the corner. This is passive automation. If something happens to overflow, it's gonna get caught in the drain. It's not gonna hit the floor. It's gonna fill up to the point where it runs down the drain into the floor drain, and we do not have a spill. She's so not gonna come in on Monday morning to gallons of water on the floor. So, also, the RODI unit is not connected straight into the tank. Of course, I wasn't gonna make that mistake. All right, is it fail safe? Now, this is something, again, that not a lot of things in the saltwater tank industry are because there's just not that level of engineering yet. However, there are things that you can do. Those of you that run a tank controller, a lot of those tank controllers have a fallback command. In other words, if the tank controller dies or gets confused, what do you want this outlet to do? Do you want it to turn off? Do you want it to turn off? In her case, if something goes wrong, the heaters are gonna turn off, but the return pump is gonna stay on. Why would the return pump stay on? Well, unless it's a leak, then it's, you might as well keep that heart of your system running to keep fresh water coming into the system, fresh oxygen coming into the system as well. So it's not true fail safe, but this is a way that you can add in that layer of redundancy. Try to make it as fail safe as you possibly can. Adding in that redundancy, in her case, we put two Ecotech marine battery backups on the system. Those run the MP60s to circulate the water in the tank. Now, she is in South Dakota. They do get a lot of snow. I recommended that she add a generator to the building. The landlord wasn't into that. So she has a wheel away generator that she would drive into town and set up. However, while we're waiting for that, in case it's a blizzard of the century and she can't get into town, these two battery backups are gonna run both of those MP60s for probably three days keep the circulation going in the tank, help oxygen exchange to help keep the critters alive. Your tank can go actually a pretty long time without the return pump running. You would be surprised on what you can get done, especially if you just have any kind of circulation going. Also in the system, you can see that it's run off a Neptune Apex. That's the tank controller on her system. I have a spare brain sitting at my house for all my clients ready to go at any given moment. If something fails and we can't fix it from afar, I have her program on a jump drive, and I have it on the cloud as well. Those of you that attended my Neptune meetup group talk, it's sitting out there. I can dump it down onto her brain. I overnight it to her. She unplugs everything, plugs everything into the new one, and she's good to go. So we're backed up there. We have layers of redundancy in the system. <clears throat> we also have two separate systems that are independent one of one another running the tank. I said that the, the Neptune Apex runs a lot of this. It runs the return pump, it runs the skimmer, it runs the Tunzi osmolator, which is the top off. It runs the heaters on the tank, the mixing station pump. It also controls the RODI system. It only lets water go to that RODI system certain times of the day, because I want to be in control of when that system is going to make water. Because remember, an RODI system is stupid. All it knows how to do is to make water. And as long as you feed it water, it's going to make water. It also does daily water changes on the system, and it will check for any leaks and do things as well. Independent of that, the Ecotech Reef Link 
It runs the Radeon lights on the system. It also sets the speed for her return pump, and it manages the MP60s for in-tank circulation. We are not 100% dependent on any one system on the tank because we have two separate systems that do separate things. All right, what's plan B? Well, we're utilizing the fallback command on the apex on our tank controller if something goes wrong. I said the heaters go off, the return pump stays on, and we can also do things like if the RODI system fails, we have 55 gallons of water on hand. Her mother has an RODI system in her house because she's a reefer as well. And she can always top off the system by hand. If the top off system dies, not a big deal. All she's got to do is get a little bit of water out of her top off container and pour it into the tank. I made the sump extra big on this system so that she can go three to four days without having to top off the tank. So there's a plan B on this. She also has the surge protectors like I showed you to run the protein skimmer and to run the skimmer and the return pump if needed. She has that in place ready to go. Now I've talked about a bunch of things today and I'm gonna open it up for questions in just a minute, but if I leave you with nothing else, go home, for those of you that have heaters on the tank, and put some kind of redundancy on your heaters. If your heaters have not failed yet, I promise you they will at some point. Give yourself this basic safety net so that you do not have that headache on your tank. You wanna prevent it as much as possible because the thing about tank automation is at some point you have to leap, you've gotta jump off the cliff. That's my tank buddy, by the way, having fun in Alaska. You gotta make the leap. You gotta do it, I recommend that you do it. You can follow the points that I gave you to make your system as safe as possible and give yourself those fallbacks so it is a great experience because this is the greatest hobby in the world except when things go wrong then it's a big headache and it's sitting in the middle of your house or your office staring at you saying, I'm going wrong and it's not a lot of fun. So with that, thank you all for coming. You know, I do a lot of things as I showed you earlier. I put out those shows on YouTube. I put it out and I get up in the morning and I check to see how many views are there. Usually overnight it's a couple thousand. I say, oh, that's pretty good. But then I get to come here. I'm asked to talk at events like this and get to meet you all, hear about your tanks. A lot of you have pulled me aside to let me know you. That really puts the name with the face and when I'm sitting there thinking about making videos, want to go to bed at night, or I'm like, I don't feel like making one today. I think about these people that I met, your story and your tanks. You guys are why I do what I do. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making the effort. Thank you, SD Mass, for putting this whole thing on. Now I'm going to turn it over to you guys and gals for questions. I'll open it up. Who wants to go first? Yes, sir. Um, 